And welcome inside episode 101 of Breaking Bass, presented by Not For Long Media. My name is Justin Ayers, uh, and I'm joined by Ryan Ripkin, first episode of 2024. Uh, also, 101 is just, it's an obscene amount of episodes, so thank you for being with me. Oh, of course. I mean, 101, it means the, the journey keeps going. And ha- yeah, Happy New Year to you, Justin. 2024, best year yet coming up. And and unfortunately, though, now that we got past, I know we probably might have said it last episode with 100. No more numbers to really count, right? There's no, there's no a hundred, there's no triple digit numbers. Yeah, that that was fun. We had a pretty good stretch there in the 40s and 50s of just like, hey, check it out. This guy wore 45. This is episode 45, and now we're just like, I don't know. It's I, I, you can't really do that anymore. But how was it? The Larry David, like, how long after the New Year can you say Happy New Year? I think it's I think it's today. I think I saw. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's within three days still when we're recording this. It's January 3rd. I mean, come on. There's a little wee wa- leeway there. The other topic was what's considered the holiday? Is it New Year's Eve or New Year's Day? Ooh, that's a great point. Uh, and so actually, I think this was where we had a comment uh, doing it on my show was a listener said that New Year's Eve is the party. New Year's Day is the holiday. I'm like, well, yeah. you're not wrong. I buy that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, or as you get older, you learn to, to that New Year's Eve is one of the worst holidays of all time, and it's very overrated. Oh, so. oh that that could be. We could talk about this for a very long time, but I don't think everyone <laughs> wants to hear us talk about what we think or, or how valued or overrated rated we think New Year's Eve is. What about what do we got talking with uh, with baseball, Justin? Okay. Uh, well, before we do get to baseball, really quick, two sponsors of this podcast, two apparel sponsors. First one is called Zero Negative. It's a really cool brand. They inspire people to find positive messages in everything they do every single day. So if you want to check them out, they promote positivity and mindfulness at zeronegative.com. And last but not least, Few Will Hunt is a great athletic apparel brand based out of Philadelphia. They restore the dignity of hard work and everything they make. Check them out at fewwillhunt.com. Okay. Uh, five things on the docket today. Uh, not a ton of splashy free agency moves, but there's a lot of like little things that really could be big, big, like decision things that impact the 2024 season have been happening. So we're going to start with the Boston Red Sox and the Atlanta Braves. They agreed in a trade to send Chris sale to the Braves and exchange. The Red Sox got back Vaughn Grissom. Uh, also some money was sent back too. So Atlanta got a little kickback with some, they're only, they're only paying Chris sale 10 and a half next year, which is a pretty sweet deal. Um, this is this is fascinating. I when I first saw this, Ryan, and we talked about this earlier, it was just like I didn't think Atlanta needed to do this. I liked the rotation the way it was constructed before, but now that they did do it, like what what do you think? Yeah, so here's the thing. A couple things. I'm gonna hit this from a different a few different angles here, Justin. Let's start with the first one of why Atlanta wants to do this, right? Well, the the main reason is because Atlanta feels that they want to have another piece that could get them over the hump. They've been uh, World Series champions. They've been the best team in the NL now. Really, uh, last year and the year before, they were you know they were the hottest team going into the postseason, and then it kind of fell apart, right? So when I look at with Chris Sale, if he is healthy, and that's been a big question mark then the Atlanta Braves are still getting someone, if he can be someone of that all-star form, is a guy that could help with them with an already extremely strong starting pitching staff, right? And the fact that the Red Sox are helping to pay for some of that, it just seems like the the Braves are all in. It makes sense. Why not? On the Red Sox side of it, we, we're kind of reading between the lines. And Justin, I know you're going to touch on this in a second, but the Red Sox right now in that division in the AL East don't seem to be contenders. And, and that can change. It's not anything against the Red Sox, but if you're looking at the rest of the division where the, where teams are at, you're not feeling as strongly about the Boston Red Sox. So what do you do? You unload a player, which they signed to a five-year $145 million contract. You send them away. And in return, you get a foundational, hopeful foundational piece in Vaughn Grissom. And Justin, Vaughn's a great player. And I know people are looking at, you know, he's that last out in the playoffs for the Braves. He's had limited time, and he's done solidly in his limited time in the big leagues, but he wasn't going to be a piece for them long term. So this could be a great thing for him, a young player with a lot of upside. But I know it's not moving the needle for Boston Red Sox fans, and I know we follow the AL East a lot, Justin, just from where we are. Fans of the Red Sox are probably not immediately going to be happy with this decision. 
No, it's it's fascinating from the Red Sox perspective because over the last five years, they've gone 356 and 352. That's the 16th highest winning percentage out of the 30 clubs. They're they're playing as if they're like a mid-market team. And I, I even saw today they're looking to shed additional salaries after this. They, it's just weird to think that the Boston Red Sox that were for so many years the big bad boys in the ALE spending and outspending and and even this offseason where they've been linked to so many dudes and they just haven't been able to sign them. Like their their front office with Hein Bloom, who they just fired, they're like, hey, this guy's not getting it done. You know, he's trying to build a contender on the cheap. Let's do something different. And then Craig Breslow comes in, does the same exact thing. And then they they just basically swap him out for Lucas Giolito, I guess. I, I don't really know how what basically they're just like taking more expensive players and then just getting back or just like signing a lesser, cheaper version in free agency, which I don't really know that Sox fans love. Yeah, and I think it, it stems even more when you look at the fact of what's happened over the last few years with the Boston Red Sox. You know, J.D. Martinez, gone. Mookie Betts is the big one, gone. Uh, Xander Bogarts, gone. You know, so these are guys, there's a lot of homegrown or talent that you had on your roster that you felt like could be a building point. Now, of those ones, obviously, J.D. Martinez, older in his career, but when you're looking at a guy like Xander and Mookie, Two of the best in, at their position. Mookie's a top five to me overall player in the game. That's a lot. But, you know, to your point, the Red Sox seem like they're trying to make a little bit, I don't want to say necessarily like a youth movement, Justin, but you can tell that they're really trying to realign themselves for the future. And for a guy like Luz, Lucas Giolito, it's still a, a little bit of a gap, you know, age-wise between him and Chris Sale. It's a five-year gap, right? So you're hoping – Lucas Giolito, if it works out and you have the option for a uh, second year, that could be a blessing in disguise or a, a diamond in the rough could be one of the best signs of, of the offseason. Could be if Lucas can get back to his old form. But if you're a Red Sox fan going, man, we just spent, did we just overpay for a starting pitcher where there might not necessarily be the direction that Boston fans are looking for? Boston's still going to be competitive, Justin. Like they, 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 they are still run overall their structure has been solid but it's just as a fan it's not going to move the needle and you're not going to feel really good about it especially with what the yankees have done and what the orioles are hoping to continue to do but the worst thing that happened to the red sox this all season is when their their chairman tom werner said they're going to be going full throttle and then now it's just become like a joke on Twitter where it's like you see like Jared Carabas, they'll sign like a minor league free agent. And he's like, hey, this is it. This is full throttle. That's such a like you can't say that and then just not even like touch the throttle. Like it's not even like a matter of how much throttle they're using. It's just like the foot's not even there. So uh, it's it's weird to think. I, I also want to go back to the Braves just really quickly because I had this thought and like I was thinking about like the balance of power in the National League and the Braves are always up there. A lot of these lineups in the NL that are like good, like the Phillies and Dodgers, like they have a lot of lefties. And I would love to see come playoff time, Chris Sale coming out of the bullpen if he doesn't get, you know, one of the top three spots in the rotation. Like, what if we just see Chris Sale come out to face Freddie Freeman and Otani or, you know, Schwarber and Harper? Like that that could be the secret weapon in October. That that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's also why they're they're trying to make the move. But first off, the Brave the Braves GM can't miss. You know, he's what the Braves have done over the last five seven years, or however you want to look at it. The deals that they've made, the trades that the players that they've gotten, it just felt like they've done so many things right. And in this case, to me, what's the worst that happens? Well, you you have to eat a salary of a player that you're already getting a discount from. And it doesn't pan out, right? Sale doesn't return to his form. You don't get it. But what's the upside? And the upside is, is that for your exact reason, Chris Sale gets back to somewhat of that all-star form, or maybe he gets back to it. And if he does, you know, you've heard me say this, this saying before, holy shirts and pants, Justin, then, then this could be a really big uh, spot for the Braves to, to have especially with the guy that when he is on Chris sale for a lefty is such an uncomfortable at bat. I mean, no one as a lefty likes space in that arm slot, that talent, that ability when he's a hundred percent, you know, and I don't know if he's going to be that old Chris sale, but I'll tell you what, if he's close to his hundred percent, that is not going to be a comfortable, a comfortable at bat for a lot of those big power lefty batters. Yeah. Like, 
you know, last year his numbers were like, they were pretty good. He, he still like gets swings and misses. His strikeout rate was still really high. And yeah, he's not going to be Chris Sale from five years ago. But yeah, I mean, if, if he could stay healthy, but even if he doesn't, like the Braves are so stacked rotation depth wise, it doesn't even matter. Um, you, you brought up their GM, Alex Anthopoulos. I feel like, I don't know. I, I always forget that like, you, know, you talk about like the best GMs in baseball, you'll throw names out like our guy in Baltimore, Mike Elias. Like there's like names that you hear over and over. I don't think Alex Anthopoulos like gets enough credit if that's possible for what he's built in Atlanta and even in Toronto before that, which he, he crushed it in Toronto as their GM. Like, you, do you remember in 21 when he just rebuilt the entire outfield in the trade deadline and then they won the World Series? Like, that's this guy's awesome. He deserves all the credit. And, you know, it's and that's why everyone you see those Breaking Bad memes of uh, is it Jesse? It's like, why did how do they keep getting away with this? Like, that's what everyone yeah. feels with the Braves. It's like, how do they keep getting away with this? What do you have on these players? But to be honest, you're seeing a GM that is willing to make moves. He's willing to pay his players that want to take these de- these deals, and some of them can be bargains for the team, but other it's giving stability. And we've talked about it. You just don't know what's going to happen with some of these young players. He's giving them an offer. It's helping the team. It's helping the players short term. Hopefully, might be able to help them long term. But in this process, he's not afraid to be aggressive to make the team better. And all he's done is help build. A really, it is a juggernaut. I know the Braves haven't, you know, they've disappointed the last two years in their eyes, but they have been consistently one of the top two, top three teams over the last four or five years. And a big reason is because of of what has been constructed there and and the architect of it all. And how, it's Alex Anthopoulos, right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Because I don't want to mess up. I know I messed up Jared Kelnick's last name last time for people that tuned in. I know. God forbid. Stop traffic on it. It's and I apologize to him and all the Braves fans that that I upset in the process. But but you have an architect that has created a masterpiece of a roster for the Braves over the last four or five seasons. Which, as a baseball fan, it's been awesome to watch. My favorite Alex Anthopoulos stat, and then we'll move on. The Braves are the first team in the free agency era to have all eight position players locked up for three or more seasons. None of these salaries exceed twenty two million across their duration. That's like, if you look at like the Braves, like future contract spending table or whatever, if you go on like Spo track or whatever, it's like, yeah, we just have everybody for eight more years. So, uh, we're going to kill it. We're going to keep being first place in the NL East every single year. Mark that down. Um, it's the best. And Hey, you know what? I think because of how many nice things we've said about the Atlanta Braves, I think we're allowed to mispronounce Kellenic. Kellenic. We are. So either, Kellenic, one. Kellenic, either one. I hope he balls out for you guys. I hope he it. balls out. He's gonna he's gonna ball out. Braves Braves are gonna ball out. They uh, we'll see what happens with the Red Sox. And uh, isn't there another team that's that's tra- making moves, Justin? But it's not necessarily maybe these splash moves that everyone's talking about. Yeah, I think Brian and I might have talked about this a couple weeks ago. Where it's just like we look at the San Diego Padres and all the people that they've lost in free agency, especially on the pitching side. Um, I mean, like it's they're all, the starters, obviously Snell, Waka, Lugo, Martinez, but like the bullpen. Guys like Josh Hader, Tim Hill, like there's a lot more guys that they've lost in free agency on that side of the of the pitching staff that it's it's really hurt them. And if you remember, the Padres have been in, in salary, you know, it's it hasn't been great. They, they have been having to take yeah. out loans to cover payroll. They don't have a ton of money, but they've been super active in bringing guys in from especially Asia as of late. They just signed Yuki Matsui, five years, $28 million from Japan. Uh, you know, he probably played against Brian in the MPB there. Um, he's going to be their setup guy. And the, today they finally n- uh, nailed it down two years, four and a half mil for Korean pitcher. Woo suck go. Um, you don't see a team that like spend this much in one particular, like, like guys, obviously international free agents are like, y- it's, it's hard to project sometimes because of how different the different styles of baseball are. But when, when you see pitchers, especially, um, can you maybe draw parallels to something that, you know, we saw in Baltimore with our guy, Fuji. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting, right? Because we know that there's there's great players all over the world, right? And but usually some of these great players, the international market, the players then, if it's from the Dominican or uh, South America, they, they eventually most of them would go through the minor league system, right? Occasionally you'll have guys from Cuba or a guy like Otani that goes straight from Japan over. And last year, uh, Shintaro Fujinami, Oakland A's, going over and pitching there and then coming to the Baltimore Orioles. So the reason why I'm bringing all this up, you see there's different paths to it. But the biggest thing in this story is, is that the Padres, yeah, they're not spending a ton of money. 
and these could be bargain deals. But on the flip side, Justin, this is good. They're, these two pitchers are going to be rookies going against the best hitters in Major League Baseball, and that's no knock to any of the talent over in the other leagues. Those are two of the best leagues in all of, in, in all of the world in Korea and Japan, but the major leagues is the major leagues for a reason. So there, that's something to be unproven, and you saw that with Fujinami. Fujinami had a, a tough time trying to adjust and take out the adjustment of the big league pitchers. You also have to adjust to the culture being in a different uh, country. There's so many other factors that go into it. Now, could, could this all work out? And a guy like Matsui that had a phenomenal year in 2023 had a 1.57 ERA and had 72 punches and 57 innings? I mean, sounds great. That's why they gave him the contract. But can it play and carry over to the big leagues? That's going to be the big storyline. I, I even went back because, like, Fuji came over for one year, 3.25 million, mm -hmm. which, like, for an American reliever is, like, not a lot. Yeah. And then you, I think a lot of the times, like, the risks associated with bringing guys in, it's usually, like, it, it's usually always worth it. Like, even if they're they're not, like, as good as they were in the other league, like, you're still paying him three million for Fuji or you know two mil a year for the guy from Korea. It's like, you know, it's kind of like a lottery ticket. You don't really know, but if it hits, man, you got you got cheap talent. It's gonna be good for the the roster construction for the Padres when you know they're having to trade Juan Soto to cover payroll. It's yeah, I, I like this move a lot. Uh, but yeah, there is a lot more that goes into it with like the human element of like adjusting to America, and there's there's a lot. It's a culture shock for sure. Yeah, but it's also just being a human, you know, being being human as a player, as a professional. Everyone knows going into different environments, that's a task. But then also then facing your toughest challenge to date. And this is what's going to be the toughest challenge to date in their professional careers. And you're doing it in a division, by the way, that has the Dodgers that are going to be humming back for it. And then the Arizona Diamondbacks just went to the World Series. So it's going to be a tremendous challenge. Oh, and by the way, you still have a very pesky San Francisco Giants organization. The Rockies, I don't know exactly. You hope that they get back to it, you know. And I, Colorado love the Rockies, love that stadium, everything about it, right? But here's the thing. That's a tough division. We do know that overall. And that's going to be a great challenge for them. It really will. And, and hopefully they see success. And for Padres fans, you hope. And you're going to need it. Because uh, for all the reasons you just mentioned, they were trying to shed cash and they're trying to find the right pieces that can help help out a Padres team that last year severely disappointed. Yeah, you got to get creative. And I think that's what AJ mm -hmm. Preller has always done. A lot of his team, if you look, like there's he's brought guys in from other leagues and he's usually had pretty good success. We interrupt this episode to bring you a word from the official sponsor of Not For Long Media and the Breaking Bats podcast, The Original Fudge Kitchen. It is a staple of the Jersey Shore with six locations in Cape May, Wildwood, North Wildwood, Stone Harbor, and Ocean City. The Original Fudge Kitchen makes all of their fudge in-store guaranteeing a delicious product, so stop by and let them know that Not For Long Media and Breaking Bats sent you. Check them out online at fudgekitchenswithans.com as they are shipping fudge and sweet treats all across the country. Now back to the episode. There's a team, though, also in the NL that when 82 and 80 last year, the Cincinnati Reds, they surprisingly have spent over $100 million in free agency this offseason. They brought in Emilio Pagan, Buck Farmer, Frankie Montas, who they just recently signed a deal with for one year, 16 mil, Nick Martinez, uh, former Padre. And then obviously the big one was Jamer Candelario, their, their infielder. Um, I saw their GM, Nick Crawl, who said, quote, I don't see us doing much. I don't want to say, you know, never with anything. We could always end up doing something. I just don't see it right now. We're going to make any more major moves. Um, do you agree that the Reds are done making moves or do you see anything else? Like could they swing a trade for some of the infield depth or are you confident that this is going to be the class of the NL central? Isn't that kind of, you know, do you really believe everything that's being said with the, with the team or not? Right. That's kind of what it goes down to, you know, and, and sometimes it's, it's, we say coach speak or is it GM speak? I don't know exactly what the hell to say with it. But I do think the Reds, I do think there is something behind that they feel comfortable with the group that they have. And if you look at last year, it was a very, very good run by the Cincinnati Reds. And we talked about this before we came on too, Justin. I mean, this division's up for grabs. It truly is. And for the Reds, you got to feel really good about where you're at and what you have. And you're hoping now some guys continue to take a step forward. But they have a good young nucleus. And they might still be trying to figure out what you mentioned, the infield depth. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't make a move now. At the deadline in the season, sure. 
But I think they are truthful about that. I don't think they're going to try to make any big moves. And right now, the Reds are in a good position. I still don't want to count out the Brewers just because they seem to always stick around. But they're in a transition. Then you have the Cubs. And the Pirates, who knows? So really, why not Why not it be the Cincinnati Reds' time to take over that division? I think they should feel confident. This has been a great offseason also for this kind of spending because it, like the Chicago Cubs haven't done anything. Like Bellinger yeah. and um, Stroman are still in free agency. Who knows? They could go anywhere. So like if you're the Reds and you're sitting there waiting and you just see the Cubs not doing anything and you know the Cardinals had a really bad year and sure they've made something moves, but you know the Brewers lost their manager and the Pirates are still not there yet, like – yeah, I, I think the one move that I'm still a little confused by was a 16 mil deal for Frankie Montas, who I think he pitched one game last year before he got hurt. Uh, that one worries me, but I mean, I guess 16 mil is, I guess that's the going rate for pitchers regardless of injury status. I mean, because you think Snell and, and Montgomery and all these guys are out there still. So um, I don't know. That one kind of confused me a little bit. Yeah, well, I... Well, those guys, the one you just mentioned, like the Snells, that's a lot of money. Montgomery, they're going to cash in, right? So a guy like Montas, when you look at it, and we go back to what we just talked about with Lucas Giolito, right? So you can see that there's talent there, right? And there's ability and, and all this stuff and whatnot. So teams are banking on players going back, but it's a prove it, right? Prove it type of situation. But Giolito still got $19 million, right? So if that's the market right there, you know, what the hell is Blake Snell going to cost, right? And I think that's where teams are sticking with. It's that you got to be really comfortable with dishing out that money. And let's just face it, clearly team, a team like the Reds or some other teams are hesitant on that factor because either they don't want to do it or they're not, they don't think that that's a good long-term investment for them. So, yeah, why not? Why not take a chance? Um on a guy that has tremendous potential and and has proven it, but it just maybe hasn't been, I don't want to say consistent, but it's you have to go out and prove it again to really kind of be validated that you're that you're worth a longer term deal. One thing, and and we're always going to continue to make Orioles comparisons. That's no shock to anybody. Um, shock I remember, it. yeah, who 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 to thought. Uh, before last season, everybody was kind of complaining about the Orioles rotation and they're like, well, you know, like you're, you're counting on a lot of guys to outperform who they have been, who they are. You need a lot of guys to have better years. And also that's been the case for the Orioles for a while. Um, and then you look what they did last year. They had the seventh best team ERA in baseball. I feel like the Reds are in that same kind of boat this year where like nobody looks at the rotations like this is going to be, you know, a 90 plus win club. But there's a lot of guys in there like Hunter Green, like Ashcraft, Lodolo. Like they have some guys that like if they put it together just like a little bit, they could be the 2023 Orioles in 2024. Well, yeah, and it wasn't an Andrew Abbott that came on the scene, you know, and, and pitched extremely well for them last year coming up as a rookie. Right. Last year was his uh, he, I forget the I know I'm blanking on it now for his. um uh how the start he got off to, I know he finished with eight wins and, and six losses, but I was trying to pick up like when he came up, cause he, I believe he pitched against the Orioles and you know, I was impressed. I was impressed about what he was bringing to the table. So the thing is with young players, if you want to actually know what you have, you got to let them go out and pitch. And that's what the Orioles did last year. And I tell people this all the time for all the ones that said, Oh, we should have signed an ace or we should have done this, should have done that. If you take, if you do that, you don't get to find out what you have. And the Orioles found out that Kyle Bradish is a bona fide ace, and and now you're pairing him with another guy with Grayson Rodriguez, one of your highest prospects, or was your highest pitching prospect, that he can be a front line guy and possible ace. You saw Dean Kramer show his big moments, and then by the way, you're trying to get a, a healthy John Means, and then you have a guy like Tyler Wells that's, that's shown that he can now. Granted, we know things down the stretch, but. That's all part of it. And for the Reds, it's a great comp. I mean, they have some young pitchers that you're looking at there, looking at, at their, their rotation and going, it can go two ways. But don't you want to see it could be that one way? And all of a sudden you're like, damn, we had all this town and we had these studs. All we had to do is let them blossom. That's all it takes. Yeah. All that's, takes. that's Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's wrap up with uh, the LA Angels. 
Also, I remember we did a video a year ago where we forgot what the Angels were called. They don't have Anaheim. Do they have Anaheim? Los oh, Angeles Angels, do, no Anaheim. Don't do this again to me. I already, I'm, again. Already, <laughs> I'm already getting confused. <laughs> I saw that the other day, and I just completely did the exact same thing. So time is a flat circle. Um, the Angels. Uh, we're trying to figure out their 2024 direction because I saw somebody say that Blake Snell is their top offseason priority right now. And if you look at the Angels last year, they had 73 wins and they just lost the best player in baseball, Otani, to the Dodgers. What should this feels like a blow it up situation? Do you think they're going to go spend 200 million on Blake Snell? I don't, I don't even know anymore. I really don't. And and I, I really like Ron Washington, the hire, but I just feel we've talked about the direction of where the Angels are. I don't think they have a an, an a exact idea. I think they know where they want to go. They want to go back to the playoffs, but how do you get there? You're trying to rebuild a farm system that is that has been lacking depth. Like that's no shock to it. You lose the best player in the entire world and arguably the best player that will be of this generation, you know, and in Otani and you get you didn't trade for him, which I don't blame, but here you are, and now you got nothing for it. And then all of a sudden it's going, okay, what's the long term plan if you sign Blake Snow? Are you going to be competitive? And that's the part where it doesn't make sense unless you think about trading him during the season to me. I just it's not on my bingo card this year, Justin, that the Angels are are going to be a, a team that's gonna win that AL West. It's just not. And I want them to be better. So just given the history, wouldn't be surprised that they go for Blake Snell. But off of what's happening, I wouldn't also I'm not going to be surprised if once again the Angels are struggling to put it together just because there's been given no reason to have that faith in the team right now, given their their track history. It's just been it's been brutal for Angels fans. They so apparently they've shed 65 mil off of last year's payroll for this year. And you can look at that one of two ways. The Angels, I hope they don't look at it as, oh, we ha- we can just go back and reinvest and try to be competitive and win now, Ron Washington. I think this is a golden opportunity to youth movement it. They they obviously like some of their younger guys. Neto, their shortstop, played pretty well. They called the, their first round draft pick up like two days after they drafted him or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, Nolan Shanuel, shout out. Um, the, and yeah, we, we can we can look back at the the trade deadline and the moves they should have made last year uh, that will haunt them forever. But um, if you if you remember bad Angels contracts, it's probably not hard to think of five off the top of your head. Yeah, and again, it's not that, and this is why when we tell people the, the spending doesn't always equivalent to wins, right? Because a lot of things can happen. But in that case, when you look at guys going to the season, you know you had you had a team that you thought you'd have Anthony Rendon, Shohei Otani, Mike Trout three really good players and it's either injuries happened or something went wrong. And then it felt like then it was Otani for a lot of it, which it was. And it's also proving though, with two guys on the field, three, one, whatever it may be, you need a, a entire roster to make things work. You got to be able to go out and pitch and play defense first and foremost. Doesn't matter how many runs that you score. And that's just been something that the angels are lacking. So that's what I bring up. They do have some young pieces that you mentioned. There is some, positives but the negatives are to be able to have this youth movement you got to be able to have that depth for the youth you know and right now I just the angels are trying to figure that out and you're right I think they just have to commit one way or another and and see what happens so and who knows I I wouldn't be surprised I said Trout's not going anywhere I wouldn't be surprised if, if something like that changed during the season you know it just really depends on how this year goes but man, I I just wanted for so long to see Mike Trout get back to the playoffs, man. I really do. It would have been so cool to see him and Otani, and that's why they didn't make the trades last year because they were trying a last ditch effort because they thought that they could win with Otani and prove, and it didn't happen. So I, I'm I'm an optimistic guy, Justin. I really try to stay that way. I just I need to see it. To believe it <laughs> with the Angels. I think it was 2014, the last time we saw Mike Trout in the playoffs. Uh, oh, 10 goodness. years. Happy happy 10 years, Mike Trout. That's Happy 10 it, years. Oh, yeah. no. But yeah, we, we got to figure that out. But, uh, Ryan, this has been great. Thank you, as always, for, for hopping on and talking a little ball. We need to get some more bigger moves going, get the stove fired up again. I think the stove's kind of cooled off. but Yeah, it's, uh, it's cold meantime, as hell. 
It's cold as hell. We got to get that puppy fired up. Exactly. Got to fire the old stove back up. Uh, so thank you guys for listening. We'll talk, we'll see you guys next week.